what a good way to start off. Um, we're going to do something a little bit differently today. Uh, we have something special going on. We're going to uh, pray, lay hands on um, Don Hendricks, and what we're doing is ordination. But I, I really don't like to say we're ordaining somebody because I can't because what has to be evident in the person's life is that God's already doing the work and all I can do is then lay hands and as the scripture tells us to lay hands on people really in uh, affirmation of the work that God's already done or has been doing. So, we're going to, again, of course, last week I wasn't here, so, we, so you weren't in the book of Acts. This week, um, we're not going to be in it either, but we're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to look at the first seven verses as we look at what the life of a leader or someone in leadership in the body of Christ should be like. But starting off there, even before we get started, this isn't an excuse for everybody else. Hey, I'm not in that position. I can tune out. Click, you know, what's for lunch? All of these characteristics that we speak about are those that should be in the life, really, of every believer. But what Paul is saying here to Timothy is these have to be in the lives of leadership. They have to be things that, that characterize them to be examples as those in leadership. Um, but they're really simply the manifestation of spiritual maturity in a person's life that these qualities are developed. So as we study this passage, we're going to see what the qualities of spiritual leadership are. And I'm going to go ahead and read those seven verses from 1 Timothy chapter 3. Again, verses 1 through 3. As Paul writes, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are on the outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So, before we continue, let's pray. Father, we just pray as we study this passage of Scripture, you take it, apply it to our hearts, Lord. Let us see what you have for us in here. And Lord, Lord do such a work in our hearts that we see the necessity for each of us, as you told Timothy elsewhere, to be an example of a believer. And that's what you call each one of us to be. As people look to us and who say we follow Jesus, and they look at us to see if we really do and what difference that really makes in our lives. So we thank you for that, Lord, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, 
so as we go now and break this up a little bit, we're going to look at three different points here. The first being in, in verses 1 and 2, that the life of a leader or a leader will demonstrate godliness. <coughs> Excuse me. In verse 1, we see that he desires to be involved in the work of the Lord. It's a good thing, as Paul says here, that a man desires to be in a leadership role in a church, but he's not simply qualified either by that desire or just by being a man. He must be a mature believer as defined by the word. He's not qualified because he's a good businessman or he's wealthy. It's a matter of his walk with the Lord and how it is reflected in the way he lives his life. Needless to say, first and foremost, he has to be a believer. Well, you think automatically, well, isn't that a given? Well, in these days, not always. It has to, he has to be a person that has come to the point in his life where he's realized, like all of us have had to, that we're sinners. And that sin separates us from a perfectly holy and righteous and just God. And there's nothing that we can do of ourselves to save ourselves. But as the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 2, that it's by grace that we're saved through faith. And that not of ourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But the scripture also says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in John chapter 1, it tells us that as many as received him, who received him as that final payment for the penalty of our sin, as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. So that's the kind of person, first and foremost, that's foundational to knowing the person has to have a relationship with Jesus. As we mentioned, he can't just be a business person or a wealthy person and come in, hey, I got some money, I can help out the church here. That's nice, but it doesn't qualify you. Now, He goes on to say, if who desires the position of or the place of a bishop. Now, the word bishop doesn't necessarily mean here what it's come to mean traditionally. When you think of a bishop these days, you think of either, you know, Catholic or even some Pentecostal denominations have bishops and they, tend to, and they tend to be people that are like over an area. You know, they're not just one church, but they're kind of over an area and they kind of tell, you know, in a tight denominational structure, they tell people the directives of higher ups and things like that. That's not really what we're talking about or even looking at here. Um, but bishops were people who had oversight over, really back then what they had was house churches. They didn't even have a nice storefront like this. They were meeting in small groups in houses. And there could be, obviously, you know, several house churches within a city each having a bishop. And yes, traditionally, over the years, it came to be, well, there was a central bishop. And, you know, as obviously, after a few hundred years, as the Catholic Church developed, those structures became tighter. But it wasn't so then. Now, 
Now, some of them would function as pastors. If you look at Acts chapter 20, this is kind of important to this respect and how the word's being used here and, and how we're making it. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says, this is when Paul, he stops, he's on his last missionary journey and now he's heading back to Jerusalem and he's speaking with the Ephesian elders having a brief pastor's conference and he says in verse 28 of Acts chapter 20, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Overseers is that same word for bishop. The word in Greek is episkopos. To shepherd, the word shepherd there, it's poimen. It's the same word as pastor. So you're looking at kind of like title and function here. So that's why we don't make a big deal about titles because biblically they're kind of fluid in the sense that you know, they're not as defined as they are today, nor were they taken as, you know, that critical. It's more like, you know, what's the call of God on your life and how he's using you? But as it says here, uh, to shepherd uh, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. When did God purchase the church with his own blood? Obviously, a statement there of the deity of Christ. The fact that Jesus is God in the flesh who came to die for our sins to purchase us out of this lost world so that we could spend eternity with him. That's the whole purpose. And that now he has us and people called out as ministers in different functions and really all of us to minister to the lost that are still here that they might come into a relationship with him that they might know him that they might escape the judgment to come because there is judgment coming as someone once said if God doesn't judge America he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah Now, the title isn't important, as I've said, as, as being used by God and serving his people. And so the question for us is, are we actively serving God? Or would we only do it if we had a title? need to be a deacon or something, at least to do something. Oh, it's about serving the Lord. And, and as I said before, we don't, in the purest sense of the word, ordain anybody, but it's a recognition of what God's always doing, already doing in someone's life. It's like we don't put people in ministry positions in that way. In fact, a good example of this was with Chuck in the homeless ministry. I mean, it was just, he was doing it. And he asked if, you know, we could come alongside him with that. Absolutely, he's already doing it. He's already doing that ministry. It's not something, oh, let's see, who can we get to do this? But no, it's God raising people up by his spirit, working in people's hearts and his li in their lives, that's what the ministry is about. That's what church is about. It's not us about, about us trying to get things done. It's like, Lord, what are you doing, and how do you want us to be a part of it? You know, you can trust someone with a ministry 
when they simply do, do it without receiving a title. And to be honest, the years I've been acquainted, I've known more than acquainted, knowing Don well, that's what he's done here. And you who have been here and been here for a while, you know he simply does. Now, those who are called to leadership, it also says he, in verse 2, the first part, it says he shows the love of Jesus in his conduct. God has specific qualifications for those who believe that the Lord is leading them to oversee as an overseer in the fellowship. There are really two main reasons for this. The first is that they be above reproach with the way they deal with people and the finances of the church. God takes very seriously how people deal with his sheep, as we saw in Acts chapter 20. As he, Paul told the Ephesians elders, shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. No games to be played there. The second reason is that when you set people before the church, either as an overseer or as someone in ministry, you're presenting them as an example to the people in the church as well as to the world. You're holding that person up as an example. That's why we're careful, as obviously you've seen in the area of worship, where we're doing recorded worship right now. Could we just put somebody in there? Yeah, we could. But we do what we do thoughtfully and carefully because of the example that it's... that is left by those, that's presented by those who take a place on the stage. Oh, they must be someone to look to. They're on the stage. Well, hopefully, and again, that's why we're careful. The overseer It continues on here, is to be the husband of one wife. And we think, well, there's no problem with that these days. We can only be the husband of one wife legally. But that's not really the full meaning of it here. Literally, it's to be, he's to be a one-woman man. And this can be confused in our culture today. It's been said that, you know, we don't practice polygamy in our nation. What's often practiced is serial monogamy, which is we don't have many wives at one time, but it's, you know, in some cases with people repeatedly marrying and divorcing over and over and again, that we fall into this which Paul is warning about. It means that he, that his wife is to be the only woman for him. He's not to be involved in pornography on any level, whether you call it soft or hard, it doesn't matter. Also, he's to have eyes only for his wife. I could ask a person, when 
you walk through the mall and you pass by a shop like Victoria's Secret, where do your eyes go? A check on the heart. Also, he goes on to say that he isn't subject to mood swings. And he thinks clearly, sober-minded. He's dignified in his behavior and willing to open his house up to others. Hospitable. Notice that because of his relationship with Jesus, he's focused upon the impression he is making in the name of Jesus and how he can minister to other people. It's not about what I have a right to do, what I can do. Oh, you know, I'm free to do this. Well, that's not the concern. The concern is, how am I representing the one who loved me so much that he died for my sins on the cross? How am I representing him? And for each of us, after we have been someplace, maybe a restaurant or a public gathering, what do people think about the Jesus you claim to know because of the way you acted? How does the way you act reflect on Jesus? Oh, my meat was undercooked. So? In the sphere of eternity, what difference does a little extra red meat matter? But always thinking, you know, If we know Jesus is with all of our actions, being thoughtful in all of our actions, how am I reflecting the Lord? How am I reflecting the Lord? It also says in the second part of verse 2 that he's able to instruct, (coughs) excuse me, others in following Jesus. This doesn't necessarily mean that he has to preach from the pulpit or even have a Sunday school class or anything like that, but he's able to instruct other people from the word. Do you know the word well enough to be able to encourage or correct someone you're having a conversation with, even here during fellowship time or after church? You know, what are our conversations about? Now, secondly, we see of the one called to leadership. In verse 3, we see that he's not to be worldly. First of all, he's not to be a partier. It says he isn't to be given to wine in the sense he's not to be addicted to it. It's not to be the focus. It's not to be focused on drinking wine or intoxicating drink. Again, the focus of this passage is what your life is about. While Paul didn't absolutely, and I can't say that he absolutely forbid drinking because he did not. But in leadership, he said, be careful. Be very careful. The question is always about what's the best way or how can I represent Jesus and reach the lost? For 
that reason, here at Calvary, and I'll say clearly, Don knows this. We in ministry here don't drink. We don't do it. As examples. Along with, it says, not drinking or not being given to alcohol and strong drink, he tells him he's not, he tells Timothy that someone in leadership is not to be a brawler. Well, that's good to know. You want to know that your pastoral staff isn't fighting behind the, you know, in the office, aren't blowing up at each other and going, you know, the fisticuffs. Boy, that could be a bad board meeting. You're given to that. I didn't want those chairs. <laughs> you know. Okay. They should not see violence as a solution to their problems. They don't blow their stack with dealing with their wives, children, or others. They don't seek to intimidate others into going along with their opinions. They don't manipulate. Jesus never forced others to come to him. He simply showed them the way and invited them. That's what we're to do. You can, have you noticed? I mean, maybe you're like me, maybe not. Have you ever tried to make someone do something? How well did that work out? You find out it doesn't work at all. You can't make anyone do anything. You can invite. You can be an example. You can in, invite, and hopefully they'll follow, following your example. How do you seek to influence people? You seek to do it by the flesh or by the spirit, by your example. And then it goes on to say that he's not greedy. Not greedy for money. The word greedy for money means that you're willing to do whatever's necessary to gain money. And to be honest, I think we've seen over the years, there have been too many people in ministry that have been greedy for money. To be covetous as well, they said, is, means that you want money or the possession, the money or the possessions of others. The idea is that you're all about accumulating wealth for yourself no matter how you get it. You would obviously not want someone like that in leadership in a church. This really goes to the heart because it demonstrates what the person is all about and why Paul is even talking about money here. Because as Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What you treasure shows where your heart is. And again, the focus, what it gets down to is what do you think that your life is made up of? What you can is it all about what you can eat, what you can drink, what you can experience, what you can possess? A young man came up to Jesus in Luke chapter 12 and, questioned and requested that he tell his brother to share the inheritance with him. Hey, it's not fair. He's getting all the money from dad. So Jesus, tell him to share the money with me. Jesus responded to the crowd even 
that was there that had gathered. And he said, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. What is your life? Is it solely the things you possess? Is it all about what you possess? Then it says also there in verse 3 that he's not contentious. The person who is going to be a leader needs not to be quarrelsome. Have you ever noticed that some people kind of argue for sport? It's like they get in and it's just all about the argument, not about the results. Have you also noticed that many arguments are about money or possessions as well? When I uh, worked in some construction situations before, you know, it was always, arguments were always either over money, possessions, or tools, or food. Especially guys, they'll argue over, it food, over food at the drop of a hat. It's like, you took my lunch. No, I didn't. Now, thirdly, we say here that someone in spiritual leadership, he'll demonstrate maturity in verses 4 to 7. He stands before his family well. For a person to be a leader in the church, he has to be a leader in his home first. There are, they are to preside over the family as protector and guardian. They are to care for and give attention to the members of the family. What about the man... The question comes up, what about the man who has a son or a daughter who is not walking with the Lord? Does this qualify him? Well, the question then has to be, you know, why is that person rebelling? Why are they walking away? Is it because of some sin or shortcoming in the parents? Or is it that that child is exercising their own free will and acting contrary to everything they've been taught? Guys, are you leading your families in their relationship with Jesus? Are you demonstrating? Are you, again, being an example of believer in your family? And then we see in verse 6 that the leader isn't to be a newbie, a new believer. He shouldn't be a new or immature believer. They need to have the opportunity to get themselves rooted in the word. They need to have enough spiritual experience to understand that the Lord uses you because of his grace and nothing within yourself. It's not because of education, status, or position, but God uses you because he chooses to use you by his grace, his mercy. I love it. In Paul's three letters... Uh, they're called the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus. You know, in his other letters, his general epistles, he introduces or he greets the people he writes to with grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, he writes to these two pastors, these two young pastors, and he says to them, grace, mercy, and peace. Someone said it's because those guys need mercy. 
And that's true. Understanding that it's by God's mercy, by his grace that he uses us. And if you think it's because of you, for some reason, you give the enemy an opportunity to puff you up with pride, and then once you've been puffed up with pride, he condemns you for being prideful. The most important thing at any stage of your spiritual maturity is to stay focused on Jesus. Grow in your walk of obedience with him and wait for him to place you in the position where he wants you. And finally, we see that he maintains a good testimony. People in the world will always look for a reason to find fault with someone who claims to know Jesus because it's a conviction to them. You know, several years back, um, even the U.S. Army Reserve in Pennsylvania was talking about the threats of terrorism. And the number one threat of terrorism they listed was evangelical believers in the United States as being the first threat of domestic terrorisms, terrorism. While others may constantly be trying to find fault with us, our responsibility is not to give them any. They couldn't find fault, obviously, in Jesus. And they had a hard time finding fault with Paul. Like Daniel, before he was thrown into the lion's den, when the other officials there were trying to find a cause against him, they looked at him and said, in the way he did business, they said, we can't find any fault with him there. We can't find anything to accuse him about there. The only thing we can accuse him about is something in relation to his God. What is it in your life that someone find, can find fault in? Is it something you shouldn't be doing or is it something that's convicting? So if you're a believer, God has called you to be a leader in some situation. You might not be, you know, he might not call you to be a pastor or an elder, or somebody with quote-unquote position in the church. But if you are a believer, you are a leader. It may simply be among friends or people at work. You need to be prepared for it. Make sure that you're an example of godliness, that people know you behave, why you behave the way that you do. Reject worldliness because if you're living like the world, you're no example to them of what it means to be a Christian. Demonstrate maturity by living as an example in whatever situation you find yourself. If you're married, be an example of that, of that. If you're a business person, how are you demonstrating your relationship with Jesus in the things that you do, your business practices? If you'll do these things, you'll find that the Lord will use you in greater ways because as Jesus said, he who's faithful in little 
will be faithful in much. That's the calling on each one of our lives. Leadership or not. Position in the church or not. We're all called as leaders. If you're, as I said, if you're a believer, you're a leader. You're called to be a leader. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Pray you take it, apply it to our hearts, Lord God. And Lord, with these things in mind, as we get ready to call Don up here, Father, we pray, Lord, just for your blessing on him and the ministry you've already given him, Lord the work you're already doing in his life and with he and Kristen as well and family, Lord God, and just the the ways that you're using him in ministry. Father, we thank you for that. And we just pray as we lay hands on him today, just pray for more and more fruit in his life, Lord, to your honor and your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, as I said now, like Don, also Kristen, come on up. Because as I've discovered, sometimes the hard way, it's never just the man in ministry. <laughs> the wife always is as well. And so... Um, There's a few questions I'd like to ask or you can respond to here as um, we go forward. So do you accept the Bible as God's inspired, infallible, inerrant, immutable, indestructible, and indispensable word? Absolutely. Do you understand the requirements, responsibilities, and realities that are about to be placed upon you by being ordained and set apart as an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, to the best of my ability. Are you ready and willing to accept and assume the responsibility to pursue preach and practice God's word with boldness to minister to the needs of those to whom you are sent without partiality and to give yourself sacrificially without reserve to educating edification and the equipping of the body of Christ. Yes. (laughs) I was waiting there. (laughs) Um, will you endeavor to be diligent to study God's word, instant and faithful in prayer, an example in Christian piety and discipline before your people and the community in order that your life may be, worth, may be a worthy Christian example and that upon your ministry the blessing of God may rest? recognizing the sacred responsibility of your call and aware of your own human weakness, will you seek the leadership and empowerment of the Holy Spirit in order that you may be a faithful minister to him who has called you? And now I'd like to give you a charge. First of all, I charge you to pursue the will of God. I charge you to pursue the word of God. I charge you to practice the word of God. And I charge you to preach the word of God and nothing else. So at this time, I'm going to pray. And I invite you guys to as well as we lay hands on him. 
Father, again, we just simply recognize what you've accomplished and what you've been doing in Don's life and in Kristen's as well. Father, and you just ask, Lord, for uh, just a filling of your Holy Spirit, Lord God, an anointing on his life, even that he's never known before. Lord, just that you would use him greatly, Father, in whatever capacity you would have him, Lord, as, as now a pastor. So, you, Lord, use him, continue to work, continue to fill him, and bless, Lord God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Lord bless you.